God, we know your love is abundant and full. It's so abundantly awesome that you can call us out upon waters of mystery and uncertainty and know that we'll keep afloat as long as we're holding on to your hand and following your lead. It's abundant in that you have called us to be the boat, to be the, the life raft for those amongst us who are struggling and in our community that may be hungry. Even through our prayers, God, to lift up for those who are facing uncertainty in war-torn areas or dealing with the aftermath of hurricane relief. God, we know that not every day is going to be a complete celebration in our lives, but we pray that those who have the abundant spirit of your generous love inside of them might help pour into those who are having a hard day, to give, give an indicator that you have truly never left, you have never truly abandoned any of us, but you are consistently present, working in the world, both supernaturally and through the people who are called Christians. And so God, may our hearts and minds be open to receive the joy of your son today. May we remember the experiences of our past and may we remember what has happened in the past so that we might overflow from those experiences until we welcome you again, God, until you come back into our lives in your second coming to bring final victory and peace on earth. And God, when we wait for that day, we also work for that day in our full belief that your way is higher than our way. And so if your way is higher, your words are appropriate. And so God, let us join in the prayer that your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We live in a world of abundance. There's nothing to watch. And yet, we never seem to have quite enough. Honey, there's nothing to eat in this house. Let's discover what happens when we believe there is enough in a world where we assume there isn't. Hey, babe, I literally have nothing to wear. If you're joining with us for the first time during the sermon series, we're on the third out of four weeks looking solely at the feeding of the 5,000 through the Gospel of uh, John's lens. Uh, and I want to go ahead and read to you this kind of part three of the story. After everybody has been fed in John 6, 12 through 13, it says, When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets. Now, I didn't realize there were two different reactions to this part of the story until I met a few people in my life because generally the reaction is, oh my gosh, the love of God is so abundant. God provides in such abundant ways that there is more for everybody. There's enough for everybody. We have food to go share and spread. We can do food drives because we have enough food and we can give food away. I just thought it was this kind of, oh my gosh, there's enough for everybody. This amazing that, that even the miracle part of this is bigger than we can even comprehend because everybody's fed and there's some left over. And then I met people who don't eat leftovers. And for the first time it was, hold on, you're going to take fish and you're going to put it in a basket in the middle of Israel in the desert and you're just going to let it sit there for a little while? That doesn't sound very hygienic to me. It was like this cringe moment of what they were going to do with leftovers. And, and you know how you should never Google your symptoms on WebMD or Google because it's always like, my thumb hurts, you probably have cancer or something. You know, it's like the, the worst of the worst is going to come out. Um, you should never also Google, I learned this weekend, um, why should you not eat leftovers? Because WebMD and other things are going to tell you in meticulous detail the bacteria that is currently forming on your rice in your refrigerator right now. Or it will detail just how uh, slow and methodical the mold is growing on the bread that is sitting outside, uh, you know, sitting on your, pa on your pantry shelf right now. It'll give you second cause to eat anything in your house, especially when the pictures show up. 
And I guess it justified my wife's habits, because my wife is the person who leftovers that hit exactly a week. If we have eaten it seven days on the dot, it is thrown out instantaneously. And I've always been the one who's like, you know, in college, the pizza's been sitting on the floor for two days. That sounds like a good breakfast. Why not? I've always been that person. I'll always hold on for one more day. I don't want it to go to waste. I guess there's a good reason why maybe five loaves and two fishes sitting in baskets for a couple weeks might not be the best thing in the world, even if it's like divinely blessed and is not going to deteriorate or rot. But I don't think Jesus is talking about leftovers from a hygienic standpoint, because maybe we have a point from a scientific that we shouldn't keep leftovers that way. I think Jesus is not looking at people who would throw leftovers away from a hygiene standpoint. I think Jesus is talking about people who just don't eat leftovers, period. And if you're one of these people, I'm not trying to shame you today, but I am shaming you today. Because I didn't know these people existed. When Jesus says, so that nothing will be wasted, he's literally talking about pick up every— and he doesn't even say like the leftover fish. It says the scraps. Pick up every scrap so that nothing is wasted. And I didn't realize, I guess, I, I guess I've met a few people in the last 10 years that just don't eat leftovers. Like I had a friend, we went on a— it's, it, the only bachelor party I've ever been on was my friend who just got married last year, and we went to a Mavericks game. We went to dinner afterward. It was a super wild time. And uh, as we were out for dinner, um, you know, there was about 12 of us gathered around this table, and my friend who I grew up next door, he's there, and he orders a cheeseburger. And I don't mean cheeseburger. I mean, like, cheeseburger bef and with a side of fries. Before that, he had ordered an order of fried pickles for himself. He had about three or four drinks of the you know, adult beverage variety that can fill you up. And then afterward, as the waiter comes and says, does anybody leave room for dessert? He says, I'll take this milkshake. And so it's this milkshake. And it's the kind of milkshake that you get that has like the peppermint sticks and the Oreos and everything uh, sticking out of it, like not your Dairy Queen variety. And as we look down, he's eaten half of everything. So he's eaten half the burger, half the fries, half the fried pickles. He finished all the drinks, I will say. Um, and, but half the, half the milkshake is sitting there and the waiter, trying to be proactive, the waiter's been great the entire time, comes and gives him, says, here's the to-go box for all your food. And he just kind of waves away and says, nah. We're like, you're not going to take that with you? And the waiter's like, you don't want to take this with you? And he goes, no, 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 I'm done with it. So being men, we took his food and we took it home because <laughs> it wasn't going to go to waste. And we thought that stuff was delicious. But uh, one of my, the groom's little brother was actually in medicine, and he kind of looks, and he's like, hey guys, some people don't like leftovers because of these hygiene purposes, and he went into the bacterial and all these kind of, you know, salmonella purposes, and he goes, is, you know, is that why you're not taking them home? And he goes, no, just done with it. And we're like, how can, you, how can you be done with, I mean, all this good food that you could just, just take with you? And he's like, I'm done, What's, and I'll move on to the next meal. I think this is the, I mean, this is the mindset, I guess, of people who don't eat leftovers, not from a hygienic purpose standpoint, but from, I just, I'm done with it. I had that experience. Give me the next experience. Give me the next meal. Give me more. Give me what's new. Satisfy my appetite. Give me something else. And, and I have a member of my family who cooks these most amazing, abundant Thanksgiving feasts, especially. He does the same at Christmas and other holidays, but Thanksgiving is like his creme de la creme, and he will not eat leftovers afterward. And his reason is it doesn't taste as good the second time around which I have argued with him vociferously that turkey sandwiches the day after are much better than turkey the day of. And I thank God for everyone who's nodding along with me. You all are in salvation today, right? It is like he won't, he just doesn't think it tastes as good because it's not in the moment and it's not in that experience. And I wonder as these people who have experienced abundance on the hillside with Jesus and Jesus is, is taking up all the leftovers, I wonder who's cringing at that moment. And I wonder who's expecting it to happen again. I wonder who's expecting the day after. What happens three days after when, when they haven't experienced that goodness in that moment, but all they're, all they're left with is the leftovers of that moment. And I guess what I really am curious about is what about the people who are asking for scraps? If you go look at Matthew 14, which is where um, the, the feeding of the 5,000 stories in Matthew 14, but if you go one chapter later, there's been a couple different stories of miracles and abundance around the Sea of Galilee, and a chapter later in Matthew 15, verse 17 is where it starts, Jesus is made it up to the northern part of the Sea of Galilee. He's actually farther. He's into Lebanon in a city called Tyre, and there is a Samaritan woman who comes barging in on the scene. 
And, and reminder, Samaritans and Jews don't like each other. It's this bit ethnic divide that existed at the time. And so for a Samaritan woman to come barge in and yell to Jesus, Jesus, Lord, Master, I need you to heal my daughter. She's sick. She's dying. She's ailing. Please, you can heal her with just one word, is I think how the story goes. And to see this woman's faith, to, to overcome this ethnic divide, to overcome the taboo of her running in there, she has got to believe something deep. Maybe she heard about this miraculous feeding where there was leftovers enough for everybody, and she's thinking, of course Jesus is going to heal across the ethnic divide. Of course there's enough for everybody. Or maybe she heard that Jesus is the type of person who doesn't walk on the other side of the street from lame lepers and blind people, but he's the kind of person who stops because there's room in the temple for everybody, and, he can, and there's room for healing for everybody, and he's the kind of guy who believes in the abundant love of God. Maybe that's why she came rushing in here, and I doubt she was expecting the response where Jesus, for whatever reason, says, I was sent first to the children of Israel. Don't you think it's kind of inappropriate to take the children's food and feed it to the dogs? But she responds back and says, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat from the scraps of the master's table." This woman of such faith just wants a little bit. She just wants a mustard seed. She just wants a splash of water. She just wants a little bit. And she has faith that just a little bit is going to satisfy because of her faith that what Jesus offers is so large and, and so vast. She just wants a little bit. She just wants a scrap of food to be satisfied. She just wants a little bit of a nugget of hope. She just wants a little kernel. And meanwhile, we have an entire nation that is somewhat ignoring the abundance that Jesus is offering them versus the Canaanite woman who just wants a little bit. She's not taking for granted this experience. You know, I learned in researching for this sermon that worldwide, one-third of the food that is served, prepared, one-third of the food that's on the tables at restaurants, that rots in our refrigerators, one-third of the food that's, let, that's overstocked at grocery stores, one-third of the food in the world is thrown away because of waste is wasted food. And there, are, and there are food organizations that are trying to recapture that. If you look to America, 40% um, of the food that's on restaurants when we order these gargantuan platters uh, in our refrigerators when we go to Sam's and we think that we need seven gallons of barbecue sauce and, th and somehow it goes to waste because who can eat seven gallons of barbecue sauce? The food that's overstocked at in, in supermarkets in areas that can afford to overstock food in supermarkets. 40% of food in America goes to waste. Now, 40% is estimated to be able to feed 2 billion people, which is six times the population of the United States. Because we live in a world of abundance where we take for granted that the supermarket is always going to have food. We live in a world of abundance where we just assume, well, you know what, that's going to go bad. We'll just buy some more. Go ahead, throw it away, and we'll just get some more. When there are people who would desperately want the scraps. That's why we're doing a food drive right now. It's not the whole picture of poverty alleviation, but it's at least saying I can have hope because if I have this pool of money and it's a limited amount of money, this gift of food provides me an abundant thought of I can, okay, I can pay my phone bill so I can get a job or I can afford my rent. And this takes care of just giving me a little bit of that hope, a little bit of nugget, a little bit that someone cares. And I have a future and a hope and a promise as God has for me because this church is taking this food drive. I think the question on the flip side of that is, what about those who have experienced abundance? Are we savoring this moment that we have? Are we savoring the meal that we have? When I was uh, in seventh grade, my uh, parents' uh, 20th wedding anniversary happened. And this was the first time, for whatever reason, they decided that they should bring us along on their uh, 20th anniversary celebration. So we went down to Del Frisco's Double Eagle Steakhouse in Dallas. And if you've ever been there, you know it's fantastic. But as a seventh grader, my experience of steak at this point was only my dad's cooking in the backyard. And many of you know who my dad is, so don't tell him that he is not the greatest steak cook in the entire world. There's a reason why my mom now asked my brother and I to cook for steak when we have family gatherings like this. So I was not all that excited about it, but never been to a big steakhouse before. Go down there, and being a seventh grade boy with no, with, with no prior conception of prices at a steakhouse, I ordered a 24-ounce porterhouse steak for myself with a side of mashed potatoes and a side of green beans. I started with a Caesar salad, side Caesar salad, and about three of the loaves of bread that come on the table. I had about three or four Cokes uh, to accompany my meal. And as everybody was finished up and were nice and full, the waiter comes and says, 
Would anybody like dessert? And right as my dad is about to say no, I say, I'll take the chocolate mousse, please. Because I'm a seventh grade boy. I could eat the entire supermarket and feel fine the next day. And I have no preconceived notion that I am putting my dad in the bankruptcy while I'm doing this. And you know what I remember about that moment? I remember that moment because my parents were dumbfounded at how much I could eat and that I had no clue what I was doing. I don't remember that moment for how it tastes. I don't remember the next day waking up and thinking, I can't believe I got to experience that. That was the greatest thing that I have ever experienced. But what I do remember is when I got to college, one of the next times that I got to do a big fancy steakhouse was I went to Riata. It's still one of my favorite restaurants. It's over in Fort Worth. And um, I went there uh, freshman year. My dad comes over to Fort Worth and says, hey, why don't we go out to a nice dinner? So we go downtown to Riata and uh, walk in and, you know, I'm a little older and wiser. So it's not a 24-ounce porterhouse. It's just a 16-ounce ribeye that I get, and it's perfectly seasoned, and it's perfectly marbled, and it's perfectly slathered in butter. And I remember taking the first bite of that, and just, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, one of those moments that you just think, I am eating heaven in a, on a fork. And I remember every bite, and I remember the next day waking up thinking, I have got to get more of that. Just knowing how good it tastes, knowing the smells, I can still, I, I savored that experience. The, the, the first experience was just, uh, give me a meal I'm going to eat tomorrow. Just let me get, you know, give me this, give me that, give me this. But the Riata experience was one in which I remember every detail of it. And you know what? I don't know what your meal plans are like, but I'm not eating at Riata or Del Frisco's every day. I doubt you are either. But I remember that moment pretty good. I think there are two reasons why Jesus has so much of abundance and so many leftovers at this amazing meal that's served between five loaves and two fishes. This incredible, mind-blowing experience in which people must have gone out of their minds thinking, how in the world did he do this? How are we feeling so full from so little? How could, how could this happen? And what is he going to do with all the leftovers? Well, I think the first part is what we talked about week one, and that there's enough for everybody. Jesus is providing these 12 baskets of leftovers so everybody recognizes we had our fill and there's still more to help us gain perspective on what is enough and that we don't have to hoard and we don't have to dominate and we don't have to cling to, to be satisfied. We can trust that God has enough for everybody and we can give food and we can give opportunity and we can help other people. Even a Samaritan woman who may come busting in right now and ask for help because we believe that God provides. I think that's the first reason. But I think it's the second reason where Jesus specifically says, so that nothing may be lost. And I don't think it's just about the scraps of food. I think he wants them to take leftovers so they remember the experience. I think he wants them to hold on to the leftovers so that they know that just because they're not getting fed 5,000, or just because they're not getting fed miraculously the next day, doesn't mean that God left them. Doesn't mean that Jesus isn't going to show up that day. So I'll tell you, the number one spiritual dilemma, crisis that I encounter inside of our church and outside of our church, family, friends, every which way, is the, I had a mountaintop incredible experience at some point, and I felt so close to God, and now I don't. And it's the, I went to church camp as a kid, and oh my gosh, the music was great, and we jumped on the blob, and it was a fantastic experience, and everybody was close, and it was hunky-dory, and we sang Kumbaya every night, and we had s'mores, and, and God was in that place. Or you know what, I had this amazing Sunday school class as a young adult and we were tight and we did everything together and then we had kids and we all kind of grew apart and we moved to different places. And I just can't recreate that experience. And you know what, I went on the walk to Emmaus and I had this fantastic experience where people were pouring love into me and I just felt the love of God so perfectly. Or I was on a mission trip and I went and I served somebody else and that serving just made me so close to God. I felt God's presence so heavily, but then, you know, I went to work the next day. And you know, it's been months since I did anything like that. It's been years since I found the right experience. It's been, I, I just, I don't feel it anymore. And what it becomes is kind of this nicotine fix of spirituality. It's like I had this high at one point, and I've got to live on this high all the time or else God just drops out. It's, it's like when you start smoking, you have to keep smoking more because it just, you don't feel it as much. And we have these high experiences. Maybe it was a great worship service. I'm sure it's this sermon, right? It's this fantastic experience that fills our hearts and our souls. And we just know how close and present and real and active God is in the world. And then five days later, it just doesn't feel that way. Or five months later, we just don't have that same experience. Maybe it is our fault because we haven't put ourselves in the way. Or maybe it's life circumstances that just seem hard and we're questioning. 
Jesus gives us 12 baskets of leftovers to remind us not every day is going to be like this. Not every day is where you're going to go up on a hillside and you're going to reach the mountaintop and there's going to be abundant food and abundant life and a gathering of people that all get along and it's all going to be hunky-dory and it's going to be absolutely amazing 100% of the time. Not every day is going to be like that. Jesus doesn't experience every day like that and he's God's son. Jesus gives them 12 baskets of leftovers to remember that even three days later, the steak still, still tastes pretty darn good. And you know, we had that moment at one point. And if we had that moment at one point, we know it's true and we know it's real and we know it can happen again. If we've experienced a spiritual high at one point, we knew God was with us. It was true. It was authentic. It was real. Why do we not believe it can happen again? Well, because we're not eating the leftovers. Because leftovers are inferior. We need to be in the moment. Give me now. Give me something new. Give me something to whet my appetite. Give me something entertaining. Give me something that's going to make me feel alive again, as opposed to recognizing not every day is like that. Not every worship service is like that. Not every mission trip is like that. Not every family encounter is like that. Sometimes we have to live in the real world of recognizing that sometimes life just happens. And the big spiritual moments are often when we put ourselves in the way of what God is already doing and we open up our lives to recognize that there is abundance around us and that we could be a part of that. But in the meantime, those are the anchor points to recognize just because I'm not having it the best experience right now doesn't mean that God didn't fill me up for this moment to happen. Doesn't mean that Christ didn't give me enough to make it through the trials and the hard times and the tribulations. Doesn't mean that the overwhelming love of that moment didn't pour over. And you know what? Maybe, maybe we're on the tail end of that. But the Samaritan woman is looking for just a little bit. Because if there's just a little bit, there's still something there. And if there's just a little bit, and we experienced abundance before, well, God's a God of promises. God's a God of eternity. God's a God of consistency. If we experienced it before, it'll happen again. If we hold on to a little bit, if we remember the leftovers still taste pretty darn good of what God gave us in those amazing, amazing moments. Not every day is going to be miraculous. Every day might be a miracle, but it's not going to always feel miraculous. But if we have experienced God before, if we have experienced joy before, if we have experienced elation before, it will happen again. And God has filled us up until that moment comes. Let's pray. Gracious God, in the mustard seed of faith that might rest in our hearts right now, may your spirit come and enliven it into a big flowery bush. May the scrap of food that we are clinging to to satisfy our appetites turn into an abundant wedding feast that just keeps growing as you invite more people. God, may we hold on to those moments of celebration and joy and ecstasy, those moments of closeness, those moments in which you showed up at our hospital bed to help show us that there is healing in all things and there is life after death, to show us that you are a God who took on death full force and rose again so that on the third day we might know that there is promise on the other side of hard things because you are a God who never leaves and you are a God who brings good things out of all things. And so, God, for those of us who may feel like we're in a vacuum or a desert, for those of us who may be starving and hungry, for those who must be thirsty, I pray, Lord, that they would be surrounded by those who would feed them. I pray that you would guide them to the experiences so they might recognize again and a full and a fresh how good you are and how present you are and how full you are. And then it might change all of us, God, that we know we have enough, that we know we are enough. And that when any Samaritan woman comes rushing through the door asking for healing or asking for food or asking for sustenance, that we have so much in our hearts that we are just freely generous, wastefully generous with how much we'll love that person. And so God, fill us up and let ourselves be full. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.